Hi there, my name is Aaron Gill and welcome to 100 Stories Deep. So today I'm going to be reading uh, from The Book of Birmingham, a city in short fiction. Uh, yeah, it's an anthology of short stories about Birmingham and I'm going to be reading uh, a short story called Exterior Paint by Kit Dewar. And the reason why I've chosen this story is because it really reminds me of some of the stories that I heard growing up from my grandparents and relatives about what it was like to come to the UK in the 60s and 70s and their experiences uh, since then till now. So yeah, that's Exterior Paint by Kit Dewar from the Book of Birmingham. Here it goes. The estate agent is optimistic. That's what he said on the phone. And now, at the front door, he offers his hand and smiles. Baxter. Mike Baxter. From Baxter Bryan. Alphonse Maynard had been watching from the front room window for 15 minutes. He saw Baxter pull up in his white car. He saw him get out and walk along Marshall Street, looking up and down the road, in front gardens and back alleys, peering at the uncut hedge at number 85, the shoddy porch at 49, and the permanent satellite dishes on every house but his own. Baxter made notes on his clipboard and tapped the side of his head with his biro. Danny rang the bell. Alphonse leads him through the house from front to back, through the narrow hall and the two sitting rooms where no one sits. Rooms that smell of air freshener, beeswax and unopened windows. In the back room at least, the smell of thyme and pepper have settled in the nap of his armchair. Spicky stop, spick, sticky spots of coffee and rum decorate a little mahogany trolley. There is a formica dining table and chairs for his dinner, a display cabinet for his wife, his children and grandchildren, a footstool for his bad foot, a free view box for the television and news, and a black CD player for Nat King Cole. The estate agent moves the net curtains aside to look out into the garden. A proper garden, he says. Some on the other side of the road have barely more than a postage stamp. And you've got a shed. He scribbles something on his pad and taps the window frame with the tip of his pen. Double glazing. So, you've been here for a while, have you? Alphonse moves aside so the estate agent can be the first in the kitchen. The one Lillian had installed eight months ago and had used exactly five times. Since 1964, he says. I used to rent it, then I bought it. My wife's idea. Good, good. You'll see a handsome return on your investment then, Mr. Maynard, says Baxter, running his hand along the work surface like it's a woman's smooth skin. Solid timber, says Alphonse, knocking on the cupboard doors. It was my wife that she wanted it. Now she's dead. Baxter doesn't turn his head. He takes his time and then he makes his announcement in full. <clears throat> On behalf of Baxter Bryan, I would like to offer my condolences to you, Mr. Mayard. Sorry for your loss. And Alphonse soon realises that for Baxter, death is a professional boon. You have a... Baxter moves through the downstairs kitchen to the little toilet of the lobby. Ah, oh, yes. Downstairs cloakroom, wash hand basin, fully tiled, modern white suite. Then back through the kitchen, noting the name of the boiler as he passes. Domestic hot water and central heating, he says to himself. He motions to the staircase. Lead the way, Mr. Menyard. Alphonse shows him the little bedroom at the back with its single bed. It still has Lillian's sewing machine set up at the little vanity chair that she used to scuff along the carpet to sit at. Whatever she was sewing when the stroke knocked her backwards had been tidied away. The room is dark and lifeless and Alphonse closes the door quickly. The second bedroom lost its bed 20 years ago when Lillian declared it a dressing room. She had wardrobes built on every wall and mirrors on every door. It reminds Alphonse of a circus, or somewhere you might take a child for a day out. A child that might slip your hand and get lost running away, 
and the very thought of this room had lately began to give Alfonso nightmares. So he only stands at the door and lets Baxter go in alone. Useful second bedroom, he mutters, large double. The biggest bedroom overlooks the street. Why Alfonsi is embarrassed to be standing in there with another man, he does not know. He is tucked in the sheets and blankets as he does every morning. His shoes are out of sight. There is no dirty washing in the pink laundry, laundry basket and no dirty magazine shoved underneath his mattress. But the room still smells of man and not of woman. And that's enough. Master bedroom, says Baxter fitted with wall lights, central heating and a telephone socket. Baxter measures up and is done in 15 minutes. Presentation is everything, Mr. Maynard. He says as he shakes his hand again with Alfonsi on the doorsteps and flicks his eye to the peeling green paint on the front door. Red cells. In that armchair that evening, Alfonsi cries. The next day, the lady at B&Q will help him choose the colour of bloody red for the front door. Lillian would have been in charge of colour, but the woman that helps him is blonde, like Lillian, with the good shame shape and an easy smile. There you go, Bab, she says. September's a good month for painting. Not too cold and not too hot. Alfonsi buys paintbrushes and sandpaper and undercoat and white spirit and a new flap for the letterbox in brass, with rope edging. He puts some chicken to stew in his still new oven and reads instructions on a tin of paint. He pours himself a little rum in an amber glass and sits back in his chair. This will be a two day job. The next day Alfonsi is outside early enough to watch the children go to school. All of the children are brown, one shade of the other, in headscarves or cornrows and Alfonsi realises that there must have been a time, just before he came from St Kitts, when all the children on Marshall Street would have been white, when maybe there was a white man standing at this very gate, with sandpaper in his hand, his shirt sleeves rolled up, a man with a tin of green paint, watching white mothers wheel their prams around the corner to the shops. Alfonsi has brought out a kitchen chair. He will work from the bottom up, first with sandpaper, and then he'll paint on the undercoat. Mr. Kang, his neighbour, stands in his porch next door. You've been a stranger, he says to Alfonsi. Oh, I've been busy, you know, tidying up and throwing things out. I got a valuation yesterday. Good? Yeah, good. Mr. Kang folds his arm across his chest. What colour? Red, says Alfonsi. Red is for celebrations, my friend, says Mr. Kang. And when you leave, it will not be a happy day. Alfonsi nods. My daughter, she lives in Sutton Coalfield. Mr. Kang and the big eyed Kang girls cluster at his gate. They hold hands with their mother as they cross the road. Alfonsi watches them go. Watches Mrs. Kang button her coat tight around the curve of her hip into the slip of her waist and he remembers, he remembers Lillian and the tip tip of her high heels on the pavement after dark, after her shift at the blue gate, after everyone had gone to bed. Alfonsi would be sitting at the open window with his cigarette waiting. The sound of her shoes and her voice, that's what he first loved. Mr. Kang brings them both a cup of tea. Sweet and spicy, boiled with cardamom and spice, thick with condensed milk. You can't have a tea without biscuits, my friend, he says, and he whips the lid off an enamel tin, eight inches wide. Alfonsi looks in at the jammy dodgers, custard creams, pink ice rings. If they make them, we buy them, says Mr. Kang. Alfonsi takes two chocolate bourbons. Mr. Kang takes six. He won't ask, so Alfonsi has to tell him. A man was called Baxter, says Alfonsi. He put it on for 99,000, but I only must expect 96. Mr. Kang whistled. 
Not bad. When did you buy it? Things must have been cheap in your time. Cheap. The word makes Alfonsi wits. He scours at the panel door until the scratching noise is so loud he can't hear if Mr. Kang is still talking. Until he is sure that Mr. Kang has gone back inside so that when he turns around, Marshall Street will be quiet again and he can remember in peace. There are two barmaids at the Blue Gate, Lillian and Lillian's sister. They both have the same job and the same words to say to the black men that come looking for a drink after work or on Sunday afternoons when the loneliness of the day and the pressure of the four walls bears down heavy. Blacks around the side or smoke room only. The difference is Lillian only says it with her mouth, not with her eyes. You only get told once, and the second time you remember. But this is 1965, and there are new black men every week. New reminders from the barmaids or the landlord. The first time Alfonsi goes in, he opens the door to the lounge. Everyone stops talking. Stops drinking. Alfonsi looks from face to face and sees Lillian's. She gives the slightest shake of her head and he steps backwards outside, around the corner and in again through the smoke room door. She walks through the bar and is there again waiting. Sorry, she whispers and then louder. Coloreds can only drink in the smoke room, sir. What will you have? Alfonsi takes his half stout to the corner where the West Indians sit. They're men like himself, young in the world, young to the country and homesick. Alfonsi hardly joins in the conversation, his drink untouched. He watches Lillian pulling drinks, wiping down the counter. One of his new friends tugs on his coat sleeves. Listen, man, over here, you can't even look, never mind touch. You want a woman? You must send for the one you left at home. Come man, let's play a game of cards. Alfonsi holds the jack of diamonds and the ace of clubs. He doesn't concentrate on the game and loses nearly two shillings by the end of the night. He walks home slowly with his last cigarette, the collar high on his coat. Alfonsi has only come for a few years and the truth is he's not even sure he's, he wants his woman to come. Not sure he misses her. Isn't it better that she waits in St. Kitts until he comes back? The last time he saw her, she shouted for him. She shouted after him. Write to me. That was nine months ago. Then Alfonsi hears the tip tip of a woman's shoes behind him. And when he turns, it's the barmaid. He waits in the corner under a lamplight and she catches up. You left this, she says, and holds out his hat in her hands. Oh. He touches his hair and then shakes his head. I'm not myself anymore. Or this evening. Well, who are you normally then? Should I call for a policeman? If she hadn't had smiled, he would have backed away. Only last week she, he heard that someone, an Indian man, smacked a barmaid across the face and was being hunted by the police for assault. Alfonsi wasn't there, but, and he doesn't know if it's true, but isn't this how trouble starts? With a pretty face of innocence and the sound of laughter. He puts, his, he puts on his hat, he puts out his hand for his hat, but she perches it on her blonde beehive and she laughs again. Does it suit me? Yes, he says. And instead of taking it off her, he taps it down at an angle. So she looks like one of the girls that dance with Gene Kelly or Fred Astaire. She spins around as though she can read his mind. And when she stops, he reaches out to steady her. Whoops, she says and grabs his arm. There is a moment then in Alfonsi's life when his world tilts and he understands that something has changed. You better walk me home, she says. And she keeps her hand on his arm, directing him all the way to Marshall Street. 
but I live on this street, he says. And she winks at him. Yes or no? She tells him that she lives here with her mother and her sister on the posh bit of the road that bends around the corner, number 75. And that when Alfonsi and his friends moved in, she went to have a look. Everyone was talking about it. A house full of single men, single black men, four at least, getting up to who knows what. While Lillian watched the house, she saw Alfonsi open the door, put in his coat. And just like Alfonsi's world tilted when she took his arm, Lillian told him that later her world had tilted in direct proportion to the angle of his trilby as he put it on and nudged it to the side. That night, they stood at the corner and Alfonsi kisses Lillian on the cheek. They look back and around just in case they are seen and Lillian kisses him back. We'll have to keep this quiet and be careful, she says. My mum's a bit prejudiced. Alfonsi agrees. That being careful bit is harder than they expect. Sometimes, on a dark night, they twist suddenly into an entry between the terraced houses and kiss for so long that it's all Alfie can do to not ravage Lily there and then. He feels her slender body beneath her coat, the, store, the soft pressure of her bosom, her heart against his, and he wants her like food. After six weeks, Lillian has an idea. You go home, Alfonsi, and I'll finish up at the Blue Gate. I'll go to my house, pretend to go to bed and slip out when no one's looking. Alfonsi says nothing. It was Lillian's sister that got the slap in the face from the Indian man she refused to serve. The man is still wanted by the police. There are slogans daubed on bricks, walls, telling black people to go home. There are demonstrations by the India's Workers' Association about the colour bar at the Blue Gate. And to top it all, Marshall Street itself has been in the papers for being too full of black people. If you don't want a black person for a neighbour, is the headline. And Lillian's mother is involved somehow. Part of a local crowd pushing the council for all white streets. Alfonso knows what happens in America. Black men are beaten with clubs, burned alive, hung from trees. And for a lot less than sex with a white woman. This wasn't the time to let the tilt for Lily topple him headlong into his coffin. But then again, when she touches him, kisses him, when she says his name. All right, he says. I'll wait at the window. Don't knock. I'll watch for you and I'll come down. On a Friday night, it works like a dream. On Saturday, the same. On Sunday night, when Lillian finishes early, she lies down on her bed and she falls asleep. Alfonsi waits at the window until half past one and then he oversleeps for work. On Monday night, not a day they plan to see one another, he hears shrapnel against his window just before midnight. She's grinning up at him, and he takes the stairs two at a time. I missed you, he says, and he pulls her up the staircase. They make love under his pink candlewick bedspread, and they lie in the dark with cigarettes, her in his arms, pale and soft. I'm going to tell her, says Lillian. We're not doing anything wrong. No. No, he says, not yet. Christmas comes. Lillian tells him that her mother has the house full of visitors and there's not a moment that Lillian can call her own. If she's not working at the Blue Gate, she's washing up and making meals. She has one cousin by her side, day by and night, and another walking her home. Alfonso doesn't see Lillian for three whole days, and he begins to wonder if she will forget about him, like he has forgotten about his woman in St Kitts. He can barely recall the promises he made to her back there, or the sound of her voice, or whether she wore perfume. He doesn't know if she has dimples and downy hair on the back of her neck, whether the moonlight makes patterns in her eyes. Does she taste of salt? Does she taste of sugar? Does she fit against his body like wet sand under his feet? 
who can't remember. Alfonsi spends Christmas and Boxing Day with the other boarders, sitting around their kitchen table trying to recreate the festivities of home without good rum, without fruitcake, without pepper and garlic for the small, small ham, without stew peas and rice, and for the first time in Alfonsi's life, without the white heat from the sun. But Lillian hasn't forgotten him. Stones cuff the window at midnight on Boxing Day, and he crushes his lips on her. Lillian is getting dressed one February evening when she sits down suddenly on the bed and covers her face with her hands. My mum knows, she says. Alfonsi sits up. He doesn't reach for her or tell her not to worry. He doesn't bundle her up and kiss her face. In that moment, Alfonsi thinks for himself and of all the viciousness of the mother he has heard about for three long months of her scheming with the others on the street to get the blacks out and put the blacks back where they belong, on the boat home. He reads the papers each day now and listens closely to the news on the radio because everyone in the foundry, Indians, Pakistanis, West Indians, all they talk about is how bad it is here and whether it can get any worse. Whether it could get like America with the Ku Klux Klan, lynching, segregations, assassinations. Lillian raises her head and looks at him. She knows Alfonsi. She's furious with me. She was screaming some terrible things. Alfonsi lights a cigarette and lays his arm on Lillian's shoulder. Don't worry, Lillian. She said I was a slut, Alfonsi. She said I was cheap. Lillian wipes her eyes and grabs his hand. What shall we do? We have to be more careful, that's all. Careful? Yes, Lily, watch your step. I don't want no trouble. Lillian stands straight. I see. She pulls the belt tight around her waist and feeds her slender feet in her stiletto heels. She ties her headscarf and places her handbag neatly into the crook of her arm. When you're ready to be a man, Alfonsi Maynard, you know where to find me. Alfonsi goes to speak, but the door slams so hard that he's worried that it will wake the house and give away the game, if there's any game to give away. Alfonsi sleeps not a single minute of that night. He squeezes his eyelids together and lies as he still, and he lies as still as his morning body will allow him. But peace can't find him. Lily has gone. Morning comes and Alfonso doesn't move. His alarm bell goes and he throws the blasted thing to the ground. Lillian has left him. He smokes cigarette after cigarette until his mouth begs for water. It's Friday, payday. Alfonso has missed his first ever day of work. He sits up in bed and peels back the curtains. The road is quiet. He looks up at the corner where he first kissed Lillian and wonders if he'll ever get to kiss her again. He has to get her back. Then Alfonsi notices at the top of the road a big group of men have gathered. Some with notebooks out, some with cameras, and standing in the middle of the group is a tall black man in hats and a glasses. Alfonsi pushes his head out the window as far as he can without tumbling to the ground. Can't be, he whispers. Can't be. There are two Indian men at the corner and a black woman too. It can't be. Alfonsi is dressed in his trousers, shirt and socks in 75 seconds. He has his arm in the sleeve of his coat as he opens the front door. He stands at the gates and looks to the top of the road and at the apparition. It can't be. Then suddenly, the black man walks away from the crowd. Just him, alone. He comes down Marshall Street, looking left and right at the houses, at the for sale signs in the windows, and the group at the top stand and watch. Someone is filming, and if they are filming this thing, Alfonsi thinks, it's because it's true. 
The man gets closer and closer as he walks past Alfonsi, and their eyes meet. Black man to black man. And Alfonsi, for the second time, feels a shift in his world. The black man walks to the corner of the road, and Alfonsi has to follow. Malcolm X, Alfonsi says over and over again. Malcolm X. A group of women are waiting for him at number 77. A group of white women, and with them, Lillian's mother. They stand in the front garden, waving their arms and shouting, Go back home! We don't want any blackies here! Get out of our country! Malcolm X doesn't turn his head. He doesn't answer. He doesn't break his stride, nor does he cower. It's as if he can't hear them. Like he's thinking his own thoughts, just a man out for a stroll on a winter's afternoon. There is no jeering, no name calling, nothing. When Malcolm X goes back to the group at the top of the road, he faces the camera and speaks. Alfonsi can't hear what's being said, but he knows it will be in the paper, it will be in the news. It will be all over the world that Malcolm X came to Marshall Street and walked along with his strong, with his back straight and his head held high. The men slowly pack up their things, put their notebooks away, and they're all gone. Malcolm goes back inside and straight to the kitchen. Malcolm X, he says. He puts the kettle to boil and plugs in the iron. Alfonsi came to England in a good suit and tie. He brings them out of the wardrobe, holds it high to the light. Yes, yes. He cleans the nicotine from his teeth and shaves carefully, closely, until his skin complains. He takes a clothes brush to his overcoat and buffs the shine on his shoes. Malcolm X, he says, and puts his trilby on and he nudges it down at an angle, over his eyes. And he will never know if he really heard the next words, but in his heart they are loud, clear and true. Do it, Alfonsi, said Malcolm X. Go on and do it. Lillian is behind the lounge bar at the blue gate. Alfonsi stands in the open doorway. Then the talking stops and the drinking stops. Come, Lily, he shouts. Men look from him to her and then back at him. Alfonsi's head doesn't turn. He can't see them. Come, he shouts. And she darts into the back, grabs her coat and skips along the carpet. He pulls her by the hand, past Dibble Road and Topsham Road, over Holly Lane and back all the way to number 75. He says nothing. By the time that he rings the bell, they are both panting. I've got a key, Lillian whispers, but before she can get it out, the door opens. Lillian's mother. She folds her arms, opens her mouth, but Alfonsi is quick. Your daughter is, has come for her things, says Alfonsi, calm like Malcolm X. Go on, Lily, and then give your mother your key. You won't need it again. Lily slips past and the woman gasps. Lillian and me will be married next week, says Alfonsi, and we would like you to come. The curtains move in the front windows of all the houses along Marshall Street. Women up and down the road and in the shops and in the pubs and clubs and laundrettes would talk for many years about the time a black man fronted Lillian's mother and got the better of her. Alfonsi would always remind people that Lillian's mother did try and speak, but he held up his hand, palm to her face, and simply said, No. Alfonsi carried Lillian's suitcase, and he carried a lightness in his heart that never left until Lillian died. Alfonsi wipes the sanded door with white spirit. He has gone down to the wood in some places. If he was staying, maybe he would strip it right back and peel off all the layers. All the layers of exterior paint that had built up all over the years. 
but he only needs to smarten it up for the sale. Presentation is everything. He will go inside now. His chicken will be stewed and ready to eat. And he will pour himself a good inch of rum tonight. Two inches. Three. He will paint the door tomorrow and afterwards he will invite Mr Kang and his wife and the Kang girls into his home, like Lily used to, when she would lay the table with all sorts of treats and sweets and sandwiches. He will buy a nice tin of biscuits from the supermarket and orange squash for the children. Alfonsi will show, show them Lily's new kitchen and they will all sit in the front room, sit and sit and sit until it smells of people again and not of furniture polish. It is a good thing to think about the past, to think about Lily. Nine days after he walks on Marshall Street, Malcolm X is killed. Alfonsi reads it in the Sunday paper and he has to sit down. He tells Lily all about it, how he and Malcolm spoke heart to heart and Alfonsi found the strength to stand up and be a man. Lily kisses him and she says that he should send a card of condolence to the widow and to the children. So Alfonsi does. There are photographs of the funeral a few weeks later and Alfonsi imagines the grief of the crying wife and wonders if she will ever recover. Alfonsi sips his rum and he knits his hands together. There is red paint under his fingernails and when the for sale sign goes up People will come and walk through his rooms and touch his things. They will open Lily's cupboards and look at her clothes, but they will no, never know the gentle touch of her hands and the way she made him feel. I love you, Alfonsi, she says just before he died, just before she died. People will come and look at Lily's sewing room and the little bathroom and they will think about changing the shower curtain or replacing the roof. They will knock down the they will think about knocking down the two downstairs room into one, like Mr. Kang has done, and they will think about how much better it will be without the armchair and the photographs of a dead woman, without the old man that lives in one room. Alfonsi holds his glass up towards heaven. Lily, he says. And he goes to drain his glass, and then he remembers and smiles. And to Malcolm. So that was Exterior Paint by Kit DeWall, and it's part of the Birmingham, uh, the Book of Birmingham, a city in short fiction, edited by Kavita Banhort. A link to the book is in the description box below. Um, so yeah, I just want to maybe just quickly reflect on that. When I first read this book, uh, all I could think about was the um, all the stories that I, I heard again when I about my family when they grew up, uh, and I could really picture and imagine their houses, the houses of my family and, and friends, and and it got me thinking about all the objects that we have in our homes and the stories that they tell us. So I suggest to you, um, in your own home, or if you can. Um, if you can imagine a relative's home, if there's an object that stands out to you, maybe try to understand what that story is. Maybe call that relative and ask them, what's the story behind that clock that sits on their mantelpiece that they've had for a long time, you know? Um, so, yeah, that's just a suggestion. Uh, so, again, yeah, thank you so much for listening. You can watch and listen to more stories in the 100 Stories Deep series if you subscribe to our YouTube channel and follow us on our socials. So thank you very much again, and to all of it.